convention. I am so honored to serve as the uh, international president. The Bishop Vincent Matthews serves as the president of missions. And of course, Dr. Dorinda Clark Cole is our elect lady in the Department of Evangelism. And uh, oh, how God is just blessing so tremendously. So again, we appreciate all of you that have taken out the time of your busy schedule to join us today. And uh, again, we appreciate everything of what God is doing. God bless you, Deacon Trout. God bless all of the saints as we get ready to get started and move forward. This is a very interesting topic that we have before us today. So I ask that you would please encourage someone else to get on the line as we share the word of God. Bless you, Evangelist Clinton. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties with our Periscope audience, but we're going to move forward. We have our Instagram audience. We have our Instagrammers as well as our Facebookers. Now, as we move forward, uh, many of you here, bless you, uh, Elder uh, Riley, President Riley. As we move forward, some of you hear many of the historical statements that I make mention of in regard to Christianity, and I'm going to be hitting a lot of those today because do you know, do you realize that when the church first started, uh, you really did not have such a thing as one set pastor that is over a church. You had a group of elders that, is, that were over a church. And it wasn't until later on, and we're going to be discussing that, that you eventually had one set person that ended up being over the church. But in the early days, when you checked uh, the biblical, uh, the scriptures, basically, uh, Acts, as well as the epistles, you will take note in the scriptures that it's a group of elders that oversee a church and church government actually evolves over time. Someone questioned me about that today. Bless you, Brother Davenport. Somebody questioned me about that today and wanted to know where did that come from? That basically comes from church history. There's three books I want to give you. Now, who, who is um, on Instagram or Facebook that can type for me? I need somebody to type for me so that everybody can get this. There's two or three books that I want to make mention of that will be good for you to study and you can learn more about the history of the structure of the local church, the history of Christianity as a whole and how it has evolved into basically what we have today in the Western world. And of course, the Western world is affecting Christianity all across the world. Now, these particular books, they're very thick. They're, they're um, I, I tell you, they're not anointed. So you're not going to be quickening when you read them. Ooh, I feel the glory. You're not going to really feel a lot of glory because this is basically information. And uh, information is great. The Bible said my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. It's good to have information. And that gives you the basis in order to be able to share revelation knowledge of the uh, will of God. Uh, this book is entitled A History of Christian Thought, and it is by Justo L. Gonzalez, and it uh, gives you the history from the early church all the way up to the Reformation. I'm going to put it up here. Hopefully you can see it there on the camera. So if somebody can uh, type that for me, I'd appreciate it. Those of you watching on Instagram, I know you're saying, well, wait a minute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Evangelist Clinton. I appreciate that. The book is entitled A History of Christian Thought, and it is uh, written by, you can look at the bottom there, Houston L. Gonzalez, Houston L. Gonzalez. And uh, I believe that you could possibly get this on Amazon. I actually have volume two and volume three. Uh, volume two is probably 400 pages. Uh, volume three, which goes from the Reformation up to the 20th century, is about 500 pages. So you're going to be doing a lot of reading, but it will help you. Uh, to be able to answer a lot of these different questions. Thank you so much. Evangelist Clinton has it up there. Uh, and this will help you to really understand how to answer questions like this. We don't want to just go off the top of our head. I see it so oftentimes on um, social media where people will say things just basically off the top of their head. They don't have biblical facts or information. They really don't have uh, Christian history information. And so it's important to make sure that you have the right information. So I'm going to dive right into this. Bless you, Brother Bellamy, all the way from Albany, New York. We appreciate you. As I go into this, let's pray and go into the Word of God. And again, don't forget, July the 2nd through the 6th, we're all heading to Indianapolis, Indiana for the Auxiliaries and Ministry Convention of the Church of God in Christ. And then July the 22nd through the 27th, we'll be right back here in St. Louis for our Jurisdictional Holy Convocation of the Missouri Midwest Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction. There at the AIM Convention, Dr. Cole is going to be preaching. Uh, Bishop Vincent Matthews is going to be preaching. So many others are going to be bringing the word of God in the evening services. Chairman Linwood Dillard, who is a preacher of our excellence. And then, of course, the chief apostle and presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, 
Bishop Charles Edward Blake, who ministered in Milwaukee, not only in the office of apostle, but in the office of evangelist. There were many miracles that took place as he ministered the word of God. During our holy convocation in St. Louis, we have a wonderful, that's right, evangelist, uh, district missionary, Harris is on right now on Facebook. Now you'll see her name is Jacqueline Toller, Jacqueline Toller, and she will tell you right now, registration is now open, mmej.org. Registration for a very small price, you get your registration package, you get a lot of knickknacks as well as your Holy Convocation t-shirt. Speakers are Bishop Jerry W. Macklin, our second assistant presiding bishop, as well as Bishop Todd Hall, Dr. Dorinda Clark Cole, and Bishop Paul S. Morton. Bishop Morton is preaching official night. Dr. Dorinda Clark Cole is preaching on women's night. Now, Tuesday night when Bishop Macklin preaches, that's going to be water baptism night, so you know we're going up in Jesus' name on that. Well, you know when I say up in Jesus' name, if we're going to glorify God, don't attack me for that. Well, Hankerson, didn't you just do a, a teaching on the water baptism formula? So whose name are you all baptizing? If you want to find out, go to my teaching on YouTube. Go to YouTube and subscribe, and you can find exactly uh, how we water baptize. But on Wednesday night, you know, when I was coming up in Church of God in Christ, Bishop Brooks, um, it, it was amazing. Young people would just flock to the convocations. But it seems like in recent years, as I've seen and observed around the country, it's mostly middle-aged and elderly people. And you don't find as many young people as you uh, used to. So in our convocation, we seek to be different. We have youth church. We actually have kids convocation, K-I-D-Z convocation, convocation starting with a K, kids convocation every night. And they have crafts. They're going to have prophetic painting. Uh, and it is amazing to see kids excited telling their parents, Daddy, Mommy, I need to get to church because we got to get the kids convocation. So kids are excited about coming. But on Wednesday night of the convocation, uh, Dr. Uh, Bishop um, Todd Hall is going to be ministering. And man, many of us that are watching uh, Brother Hollis, we've been raised up in church and we had a mother, grandmother, grandfather, pastor, somebody to pray for us and slap oil on us and everything when we were coming up. But it's a whole generation now that has not experienced that, someone to pray for them. you got maybe three or four generations that have not been brought up in church, especially in urban areas or in the black community. On that night, we are gathering a thousand young people from the community to be prayed for, people that have never experienced being prayed for before. They've never had somebody to put oil on them. They never had somebody to slap them upside the head and say, in Jesus' name, uh, be blessed. But Elder Washington, we are going to be praying for them. And we're not looking for people to come in on that particular night that look like us, act like us. Some of these people may come in smelling like weed, whatever. They may come in high, they may come in drunk, whatever. We're gathering these young people from throughout the community that have not come from a church background. And we're going to pray with them and show them the love of Christ, minister to them. And also we're gonna be honoring families on that night that have lost loved ones as a result of violence in the community. Last year, we had a couple hundred homicides in our community. And so as a community activist, as a national president of evangelism, we're seeking to do everything we can to lift up the name of Jesus to make a difference. I believe God. Saints, let me tell you this. There was a revival that broke out in Britain back in the 1800s. There was a man named Evans Roberts. Maybe you've heard of him before. And the revival was so tremendous that the police really didn't have any jobs to do because everybody was in church. Everybody was seeking God. Everybody was treating each other right. A whole revival had just broke out in that whole community. I believe God can do it again. I know God can do it again. How many of you believe in God with me? If you believe God with me, please put it down in the comment section. Bishop Hankerson, we're believing God with you to impact your city. I don't just want to have a national office and talk about, hey, that's the president of evangelism, as I state all the time. You don't want to be a national wonder and a local blunder. I believe that through the power of God, not only can we win souls, but we can actually see the effects in the community, and that is by the crime rate going down, by lives being changed by the power of God. I've seen God do it before. Hallelujah. And I think there's a song that says, I've seen God do it, and I know he's working it out for me, something like that. Or it says, I, yeah, I hear rain. You all know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, the rain is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. He's going to bless, and we believe God. Well, let's pray and get ready to get into this topic. I need you to get every preacher on the line right now. Come on right now, saints. Help me to get these numbers up and get our preachers on the line. 
full time, part time, some time, no time, any time. Get them on the line and we want them to uh, share and see what God's word is going to say to us today. So, Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Bless us as we share your word. Bless this listening audience as we go through the scriptures and see what your word says. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus name. Thank God. Amen. Thank you again also, Elder Peyton, for the opportunity to share the word of God in Saturday Sunday school uh, the other night, Saturday night Sunday school. It was just tremendous. Yes, thank you so much, Elder Tony. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm excited. I'm under the anointing right now. And for those of you that have been fighting me about my soda, see there, you've been fighting me about my sodas. Hankerson, you're not supposed to be drinking soda. I, I've, I've compromised. I've compromised. I'm compromising tonight. I've got sparkling water that has orange flavor. All right. So that's my compromise for you tonight. So no full-blown soda tonight, no colored soda, but simply sparkling water with some orange flavor. Give me a hand clap if, if, if you uh, 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 don't mind for that, uh, making that change and making that compromise for you. As we go into this subject, you may remember a few weeks ago, I dealt with a particular subject called, is it right for preachers to charge an honorarium uh, for preaching. Let me ask you a question. Here's a question I want to ask the audience, and you all can discuss it even while we're sharing. Um, is it right to invite a jurisdictional bishop or an evangelist to come in to preach and give them an offering of $100? Is that acceptable? I've heard some people say, hey, I preach for nothing. It doesn't matter what they give. Some people will say, well, that's not acceptable. What is acceptable? What is acceptable? What is right? A lot of times there's people that have packages. If I'm going to come in to preach, you've got to give me uh, $25,000 before I get there, $25,000 when I land. Yes, there are people that actually charge that much just to come. They bring their entire entourage. You have to take care of the entourage, certain kind of restaurants you have to go to. Um, what is proper? What is proper? What is it? Is it even proper? Well, we studied from the scriptures the other night, and we found out that it is proper to bless the man or the woman of God. First Timothy chapter 5, 17 through 18 says that the laborer is worthy of his wages. The New Living Translation literally says those who work deserve their pay. So that answers part of the question right away. If you're in full-time ministry as a pastor, as an evangelist, or however, um, you don't want to be saying that you're supposed to get a certain type of compensation package and you're not actually working. The King James literally says the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so ministry is labor. Ministry will take your time. It will take your resources. It will take your money. And of course, you have to strive the best you can to stay balanced. But according to the word of God, it says, don't muzzle the ox while he treads out the grain. The labor is worthy of his wages. So it is biblical to be a financial blessing to the man or the woman of God that labors in the word of God. That is the Bible. And so um, it's not right to call someone in and then to uh, give them a bounce check. Um, it's not right to call someone in. And uh, of course, they've spent all of their finances and resources uh, to get there. And then you don't at least cover their expenses in getting there. I can write a book. I've wrote a book before, but I can write a book on many of my experiences. I remember one time getting out of town and the preacher asked me, he said, well, preacher, how are you going to be getting around town? Where are you going to be staying? I'm sitting here thinking, now hold up just a minute. Thank God my folks told me when I was coming up, you don't go no place with no money in your pocket. And so I make sure wherever I go, I have some kind of finances in my pocket to at least get me a sandwich, at least get me a place to lay my head and at least get me my bus fare, airfare or car fare, whatever, back home. So preachers, evangelists, those of you that are traveling, don't don't get so caught. Ooh, I'm just so happy. So they call for me. They call for me, Hankerson. I'm going to be preaching in El Paso, uh, Texas. I'm going to be preaching in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. And you just so happy that you just go out and uh, you rent a car. <laughs> somebody, somebody here is saying, just give me a hot dog two and a half cookies and some ketchup and mustard, and you'll be happy. Well, yeah, I understand that. Give me just a little bit more than that. I, I, I want to be able to get back home. I want to be able to take care of some bills. But um, the thing is, whenever you go someplace, whenever somebody asks you to go somewhere, don't be totally dependent upon those guests, what you need, or those hosts. What you need to do is make sure you have some money in your pocket that you can get home. Make sure you have your phone charger that you can call somebody to come and get you. Don't be totally dependent on those individuals. And then even you have to be prepared for little miscellaneous expenses. If someone asks for you to come, you must realize this, uh, President uh, Bishop, um, calling you Bishop Hollis. God bless you. You got a promotion here. On, on Facebook, 
on Facebook Temple, you got a promotion. Bishop Brandon Hollis from Ohio. You heard it first here on Facebook. But um, here's the thing. You must be prepared for miscellaneous expenses. Realize, of course, when you when people book a flight for you, you possibly may have to take care of your luggage, depending on what type of ticket they buy for you. If they give you first class, of course, you know, that's covered. If it's a certain type of ticket, that is covered. Or if you like me and you have a certain amount of mileage, then, of course, that is covered. And one thing that you can do as traveling uh, ministers and itinerant ministers of the gospel, realize this. Whenever you are asked to get a uh, ticket, and definitely if you're traveling, you want to make sure that you enroll in every mileage program that you can. I mean, enroll in everything. Get coupons if you have to. Enroll in all of the uh, programs as far as your hotels are concerned, and those are points that you can accumulate, and then eventually you get free hotel stays, you get free flights. There's many times I travel around the country for just $9 because of the mileage, and you don't always just really have to uh, fly to get that mileage when you get on the plane or when you um, get your ticket when somebody's purchased your uh, ticket there's some extra money that you can put on uh, that reservation it may be anywhere from 30 to 50 to 100 dollars a couple hundred dollars and you'll get all kind of miles for that and that adds up eventually it may not seem like much right now but then when you have enough miles accumulated that you can take a free trip to Hawaii you can take a free trip to California and sit there on the beach or go to Mexico. Thank God for it. And so um, uh, those are some things that you can do. There's certain credit cards that you can get that through spending on those cards, you get mileage, you get hotel points and things like that. So there's all kinds of benefits that are out there. So it's important as uh, evangelists, as preachers, as pastors, you don't get so caught up and who I'm being asked to go someplace that you don't think. You need to think business-wise when it comes to your life. You need to think business-wise when it comes to your present as well as your future. So the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, we said it the other day when we taught a lesson on honorariums that the laborer is worthy of his wages. I don't believe, though, that the laborer ought to price gouge. You know, you're charging $10,000, dollars 30000 for one night of preaching. Listen, there's not that much preaching in the world. I don't know anybody that is able to preach like that, that they would get $30,000 in uh, one particular night. God bless the saints of God. I'm on live TV and they're sitting here opening up this door and peeking in the door. Bless you saints. I appreciate you so much. You all wave at the saints. Everybody wave at the saints. They're, Bishop Rudolph, I got the, they're breaking protocol, Bishop Rudolph. They're opening the door while the bishop is sitting here teaching and waving. They want everybody to see him. So everybody say hello to the saints at Life Center. I want to make sure that the bishop sees them. I appreciate them so much. Listen, the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians 9, 13, that the Old Testament priests actually made their living from the ministry. It says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? Now, that brings about a question. You know, the Old Testament had the priesthood, and then that Old Testament priesthood is that equivalent to New Testament ministry. We must realize that, of course, in the New Testament, the scripture refers to all believers as priests. So we'll discuss that here in just a second. We shared with you before, according to Luke chapter 8, and this is just review, Luke chapter 8, 1 through 3, Jesus had women that were actually very prosperous that followed him around and financially underwrote his ministry. Oh, what a blessing that is. And saints of God, in this day and time, um, if you are a person of integrity, if you are a person of vision, if you are a person that is really seeking to make a difference, Minister Warlick, good to see you, people will so into your ministry. Right now, as I sit before you, I have some powerful, powerful testimonies I'm going to be sharing probably in the next month or so in regard to individuals, in regard to organizations that are literally hunting me down to give me money. And I don't mean to me personally, but I'm talking about towards the vision that God has given me. Somebody high up the other day, high up in St. Louis, said, listen, I, I see what you're trying to do. You know, the, the vision that you've given for the coalition is on the front page of the St. Louis American, the, the oldest and largest African-American newspaper in this area, I believe in the state of Missouri. Um, not only that, but the work that you're seeking to do with evangelism, Elder Bogart, if he's on the line, the ministry that he is doing with us, uh, with the uh, uh, um, Department of Evangelism, um, and with the Department of Evangelism, we now in nine universities 
around the nation. We're in Zambia at the Copper Belt University ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these are things I may have been kind of quiet about through the years because my thing is this, it's not about notoriety, it's about doing the work. But if you don't share it, then people are not gonna know it. And so that's why you're probably gonna hear me talking more about the things that God is doing. And so here's people high up in St. Louis saying, we're gonna personally give you money to do this. Uh, Washington, D.C. was just uh, in correspondence with them the other day. Now, don't you all get antsy? Well, is, he, is, he, is he hanging around Trump? Well, the Bible says that the wealth of, well, I'm not going to call the man wicked, but, you know, the scripture says the wealth of the wicked, I believe, is laid up for the just. Put that down for me, uh, 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 Superintendent Robinson, that scripture uh, reference and verse. But that's literally what is taking place right now. And I believe that that is the trend of the future, and that will get us out of a lot of this Trickery, trickery that is happening from many of the pulpits. And there's a lot of people that are doing all kind of trickery just to get a big offering. And God is not pleased with it. I was dealing with a man one time. I told you I have a story for just about everything. And I was with this gentleman. He was supposed to minister um, at our church. And this is not when I was pastoring here in St. Louis, Pastor Jacobs, but this was in uh, Springfield, Missouri when I was pastoring there. He's just laughing and talking all day, eating at the restaurant and everything like that. So the evening service comes, he ministers, and uh, he gets up and he grabs the, the, the handkerchief. Woo! You know, he's just crying and just cutting up. Oh, my baby is sick. My daughter is sick. And this is going on and that's going. And I'm sitting here thinking, look at this devil. He started to say something else. This Wakanda, you all know what I'm talking about. I can't say it on Facebook. But this man from Wakanda, you all just read him between the lines. You know what I'm saying? I said, now, he wasn't acting up like this all day, crying and whining about his daughter and everything and uh, now all of a sudden when it's offering time he's just in tears and broke and that was to manipulate the people in order to give when we have vision when we are focused when we are doing the work of ministry people will not mind sowing. I, I, I'm not saying that you're going to be wealthy. I'm not saying that you're going to be a millionaire. Bless you from California. But what's going to end up happening is people will sow. People love to give to something that is going somewhere and doing something. So in Luke 8, 1 through 3, Jesus had women that literally supported his ministry and stood with him and underwrote all the bills. And that's why for three and a half years, he was able to go around with his disciples, you know, and didn't have to worry about what they were going to eat or what they were going to wear. That's why he could say that. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. The reason why is because he had those people that were following behind, taking care of all the bills. And of course, they had to be very wealthy. You're talking about 12 disciples he had besides himself. And, you know, you can't satisfy them with just a little piece of bread and a little piece of fish. They're going to eat a whole lot. And so that was all taken care of. Yes, Paul did tent making. This issue came up in much of the discussion that took place today in regard to the post, um, in regard to this. Acts chapter 18, verses 2 through 3, Paul had a job. But realize this, according to 1 Corinthians 9, 14 through 18. Are you still there, Evangelist Clinton putting these uh, scripture references on there for me. If she's not there, if somebody can put those on, I sure would appreciate it. Paul did that by choice. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Paul did that by choice. That is not necessarily the norm. That is not necessarily how it's supposed to be. But the reason why Paul said that he was going to do it, he didn't want anybody to have the right to take away his right to bread. He knew who he was dealing with. He was dealing with those Corinthians. And he said, listen, I'm not going to have you sitting up here taking away my right to bread. He said in 1 Corinthians 9, 14 through 18, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So should preachers be paid? Yes, the Bible says that. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So we can't argue uh, with that. Again, there's excess and there's price gouging. There shouldn't be all of this price gouging taking place. Again, $25,000 for you to preach one night. No, that's really a little bit, uh, that's, that's, that's unacceptable. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you may say, well, I've got this big staff that I have to take care of. Care of. Well, I'm not the one that hired your staff. You're the one that hired the staff. So I don't know. You may have to have some chicken dinners or fish fries like they used to do 30 years ago or whatever, but it's not my responsibility to take care of your staff. I invited you to come in and preach a message. I'd invite you to come in so I can underwrite your entire ministry headquarters. So we have to realize that and, and, and think about that, saints of God, not have our minds so high up that we uh, uh, fail to realize that we're dealing with people. Um, 
I'm the type of person I'm really saying a whole lot. No, I didn't receive that in East St. Louis, Bishop Brooks. That wasn't in East St. Louis. <laughs> I, I, you almost had me to say where. But anyways, no, I didn't receive that. Uh, and I really wasn't talking about myself. That's you that just brought that up and, and brought it out of me. But I have experienced that before. I've experienced getting $100 offerings. I experienced one time where I um, uh, got an offering, I believe, of $32. I received an offering of $32. I had taken up the offering. I had asked everybody to sow a $30 seed. And what they did for the um, honorarium that I got, they gave me, and I, this is a true story, they gave me an envelope with my $30 check in it back to me and put $2 in it uh, in addition. And that was my offering that night. So uh, that was my offering that particular night. I, I can tell you all kind of things. I've had people to say, bless your hankers and enjoy the word. You just go on. That's not scripture. According to scripture, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel. Paul said, but I haven't used any of these rights, and I'm not writing in the hope that you'll do it for me now. For I'd rather die than allow anyone to deprive me from this boast. He said, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compelled to preach. What is the reward then? Just in that I preach the gospel, I'm going offer it free of charge, and so not to make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Paul said, it's a right for a preacher to receive an honorarium or an offering, a uh, love token, whatever you want to call it, in regard to ministering um, the word, um, that's his right, but but he, he said, I'm not going to use it. Now, while I'm on that particular subject, yes, it is your right to receive an honorarium, but it's also your right to be a person of integrity. If you are a preacher of the gospel, ministering the gospel as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a preacher, when you receive your honorarium, um, first of all, you should not be shady. And when I say shady, I'm not talking about throwing shade on a person. When I say shady, I'm talking about a shyster. Give it all to me in cash. You know, I tell people, no, don't, don't give it to me in cash. You, you make it out properly, make the check out properly. I'll sign the proper tax documents and everything like that. And then once a year, all of that, those records are turned into the um, tax person for the IRS purposes. And uh, I do my taxes as, as I'm supposed to. Somebody um, attacked me on Twitter recently and said, shame on you, you churches um, and you preachers, when you start paying your taxes, then you'll be able to uh, tell us something about this and that in the community. And I was able to, um, I, I can I can straighten you out such a nice, sanctified and godly man. I don't have to leave my sanctification in order to straighten out a situation. I told a person so nicely, I said, while you're talking, I believe it was maybe about uh, $3,000 in taxes uh, that I was writing at that particular time or, or more, however much it was. Uh, I said, so I do pay my uh, uh, proper share in taxes and I have a right to say what I need to say in the community. So um, I make sure when I receive my honorariums, I make sure I pay my tithes. Yes, preachers should pay tithes. Shame on you if you receive an offering and you're telling the people to sow and you're not paying your tithes. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed of yourself if you're asking the people to sow a seed into the ministry and you're not giving nothing. I, I, I say that all the time. Don't ask, don't ask me to step out on faith and sow 100 or 500 or $1,000, and I don't see you stepping out on faith in the same word that you have put out. So you're supposed to be the first partaker. So once you receive your honorarium, you make sure your taxes are paid. You make sure you pay your bills. Um, you make sure, uh, not, not your taxes, I'm talking about your tithe, make sure that you tithe, make sure that you pay your bills, make sure that you take care of your family. And if there's something left over, then you can kind of splurge. But I've seen people get $6,000 in an offering in one night of preaching and go straight out and buy a ring, go straight out and buy two or three uh, tailor-made suits. You, you, you look good, but you have nothing to show for it. And uh, people that really have something, Watch this, people that are really healthy, uh, not healthy, people that are really wealthy, um, they, they don't strive to show you, somebody that's really got it, they're not trying to show you that they're wealthy. They're not going, they're not going to be flashy. They're not going to put that out there. They really don't want you to see all of that. Uh, some of your largest uh, billionaires in the, the nation, you wouldn't be able to tell. There's a gentleman up, uh, you all helped me out with his name, Warren Buffett, I believe, drinks a Coca-Cola every day, lives modestly. What is he worth? $23 billion or so. He's not trying to impress. When you have it, you don't have to impress anybody. But a lot of times we're really flashy trying to impress people, not realizing those same people are going to forget about you in a few years. You may be riding high now, but no one is always in demand. You may have an engagement every other day. 
every day of the week, a revival every week of the year. You're being asked to go here. Oh, and you put out your itinerary. I'm going here. I'm going there. I'm going here. I'm going there. You're not going to be in demand always, you know, because eventually, especially if you're giving out prophecies, you, you better hope and pray that them prophecies come to pass. Because I know if you come to St. Louis and give us a whole bunch of prophecies and they don't come to pass, you come back the next time, your crowd's going to be a little bit shorter. And the next time, a little bit shorter because they're like, hold up, he's prophesying now or she's prophesying now and the stuff that they prophesied three years ago hasn't come to pass yet. And so um, you, you can end up losing your credibility. Realize this, you're going to get older. So for you younger preachers, that can, ah, you know, and pull scream and, you know, and pull it and all that stuff. Now, you ain't going to be pulling it all the time. Well, Hankerson, you turn it around. I tell people all the time, I'm turning it around now while I have a chance, while I have an opportunity. When I get up now, yes, come on, y'all. Everybody turn around. Every time I turn around, God has blessed me. But do you know when I get a certain age, when I reach a certain age in my life, I'm going to watch everybody turn around. There's not going to be any turning around because time does bring about a change and you must be prepared for that. So when you receive those nice big honorariums, don't, ooh, I'm taking everybody out to eat. All of us are going out to eat. You know, free food for everybody. You just blessing people and it's fine to bless people, but you know, you spend it as quickly as you get it. And then when you get to the point that you are not able to minister as you did at one time, what are you going to do? Because people will drop you like a hot cake. You can be the hottest thing today. And next week they're saying, who? Evangelist who? Doctor who? Bishop who? They'll forget all about you and move on to the next hottest thing that, that's on the scene. So you're not going to be riding high all the time. Save something up. Take care of your ties pay your bills, set something aside, especially when you're out on the field uh, as a full-time minister. Um, there's ups and there's downs. People will counsel on you. And so you don't plan, okay, well, hey, I'm going such and such a place. They're going to give me a couple thousand. I'm going to this place. They're going to give me a thousand. I'm going to such and such a place. They're going to give me another thousand. That's about $5,000. Let me go out and make $5,000 worth of bills now. Then all of a sudden, all those engagements start calling you and telling you, oh, I'm sorry. We had this plan, but we had to cancel and postpone because we weren't ready. Boom, there's 2,000 that's gone. Then you go to another place and they tell you, oh, we had hoped that we could have given you 2000 but we just didn't advertise like we needed to. People didn't show up. So here's $500. Now here you are. You went out and spent $5,000. Only $1,500 has come in. And now what are you going to do? So as a preacher, as a minister of the gospel, there's a business side to the ministry as well. And no one is going to look out for you. People are not going to feel sorry for you. People do not give to you just because they feel sorry for you. That's just how people are. I hate to say it. You're talking about the saints? I'm talking about the saints. I'm talking about saved, sanctified, baptized, and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, and that with the mighty burning fire. They will turn a deaf ear to you in a minute. So you have to look out for yourself. You have to look out for your ministry. Well, that sounds selfish, looking out for yourself. I got scripture. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you don't love yourself, if you don't have self-respect, for yourself. If you don't take care of your own business, then you're not going to be effective at dealing with someone else. All right. People that don't really have confidence in what God has given them and no respect for themselves, they are not going to respect anybody else. And so it's important that you take care of uh, <laughs> somebody just said you got a pizza for preaching. Your husband got $24. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Well, at least you can get to a tank of gas on that. That's about what you can do. Um, ministers should have a heart for the people and not for dollars. Second Corinthians 12, 14 through 15, Paul said, I'd rather spend everything for you. So understand this as you get into ministry, realize this, this is not a glamour show, you know, and, and, and you're looking at a lot of people that look glamorous. You're looking at a lot of people that look glamorous, but you don't always know what's going on behind the scenes because we as church people, we like to look good. We're going to dress good, act good, look good, but you don't really know what is happening behind the scenes. That's why I tell ministers also, don't get into performance. Let the anointing of God lead and guide and direct you. The anointing is the power of the Holy Ghost. Don't try to perform for people. There, there's some of you I, I watch and how I am. Let me tell you how Hankerson is. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. I'm going to preach the gospel. And uh, now this is in a church setting. I'm going to preach the gospel because you know we're different in a church setting versus out on the street somewhere. I'm going to preach the gospel and let God use me. If, 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 if the hoop shows up, it shows up. If it doesn't, I don't worry about it. I don't try to make something happen. 
you know, and when God is finished, when God is through, that is it. Now, if I preach and everybody's falling out all over the place, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord. If I preach and they're saying, thank God that was a good message and there's no fallout, well, praise the Lord. I'm not going to try to make something happen. And I'm watching a lot of young preachers, especially, you're going to kill yourself uh, trying to make something happen. So the folks are sitting there and you determine, oh no, we're going to have church. I can't have this. Uh, see, see, you can't be so concerned about your reputation that you forget about what your mission and your goal is. Your goal is not to bring the house down. You're not, your goal is not so that you can have such a powerful service that people put it out on social media. Look, folks were falling out. Fall First of all, if everybody was falling out that much, how is it that folks are able to be on the camera? And record everything that's taking place. I mean, if the glory is falling like that, folks got to put their cameras down. The Bible says when the glory hit that te uh, temple in the Old Testament, the priest couldn't even minister. The glory was just that great. So don't try to make something happen and kill yourself. You just screaming and stomping and hollering and pushing folks down because you know that's not the Holy Ghost knocking all them people down. You pushing the folks down and 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 throwing them on the floor and all kind of stuff and wearing yourself out. And then when you get in the back, you're just full of pain. And some, some of you preachers, bless your heart, you, you, you're in so much pain after you get done performing, you go to the back and have the nerve to go to the spirit store. And these, these some of these are sanctified preachers. We're well, supposed to be, I'll say, supposed to be sanctified preachers. Going in and getting you some liquor and everything to try to ease the pain that you've experienced because you've been out there performing. The Bible says it's not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Yes, you may get tired when you get finished, but you're not supposed to be to the point that you need to go somewhere and get you a bottle of liquor someplace. Time you stressed yourself out so much with those people. It's not about a performance. The anointing of the Holy Ghost must be the one that uh, does it. Bless you, Vice President Hutchins. So good to see you, one of the greatest preachers in the nation. Um, realize this, too, about Paul. And I said this before in the other lesson. First Corinthians 9, uh, 5 through 6, Paul didn't have a family to support. So it's easy for him to say, hey, I'm not going to charge nothing. Now, if you've got a family, it's a little bit different. If you've got a wife and kids, if you're a lady and you've got a, a, a husband and children and you have to pay your fair, fair share in the house or if you're a single parent. And speaking of that, if you're a single parent, you may not be able to run all around the nation uh, running here and there and have somebody else uh, uh, raising your kids. Um, no telling what will happen. No telling what will happen to those children. Your household, that's your first responsibility is taking care of that household. No matter how much I travel, I make sure my home is taken care of. When I'm gone on the field, my family has food. They have gas to get around. The, the, the lights are on. The gas is on and everything is on. They don't have to worry about things being shut off and go to flip the lights and the light. What, what, what happened here? He didn't pay the light bill. I make sure everything is straight for my family, that they have food to eat and all their needs are taken care of. Now, again, don't be greedy, but the Bible says in Galatians 6 and 6 that if you present the word of God, then you're to be taken care of from the ministry. Galatians 6 and 6, the person who has taught the word should share all good things with his teacher. Now, well, Hankerson, how come you don't make an appeal here on uh, Facebook? You can do that if you want to here on social media. You can go to uh, Givelify and, and go to the Life Center uh, uh, page there on the Givelify app or the evangelism page on the app and, and give. But uh, the thing about it is you don't want to be constantly on here just making all of these appeals where it looks like you're just doing things for money. But there is a time and there's a place where people should bless the person that is instructing them. Ministers should supplement their income according to Deuteronomy 8 and 18. God does give you the power to get wealth. So it's important to have investments. It's important to have retirement. I want to ask every preacher, those of you that are uh, saying you're in full-time ministry. Do you have your retirement program set up? See, see what it is, you don't want to get a certain age. People say, and I thank God I was raised by people in ministry that really made sure that things were taken care of for them uh, when they would reach that elderly stage of their life where they wouldn't have to be dependent upon the church. Um, and it's a sad thing when you see people that, you know, and I'm not trying to be um, vulgar or anything like that, but, you know, they're having to wear uh, diapers at a certain age, can't control uh, their, their bodily waste, and sitting up there still trying to hold certain offices and positions. And the reason why a lot of times is because the church has just been their entire life. The ministry has been their entire life, and they've just set out, I'm just here to serve God. And so they don't think about the future. And so a lot of times they're trying to stay in those offices just to get that little offering so that that could supplement with their 
Social Security and all because they don't have any retirement that's set up. That is a sad stage to be in. I started, actually, this is my 30th year in ministry, 25th year uh, pastoring. Um, I started when I was uh, probably about 2021, 20, uh, setting up investments for the future, you know, for my time of uh, retirement. I'm not going to retire from serving God. I'm not going to retire from uh, being a preacher. Once a preacher, always a preacher. Even if you backslide, you're still a preacher because they're going to say that's that no good backslidden preacher out there. So that <laughs> is still going to be with you. Once, once, once it's on you, it's just on you. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't want to be at that stage at a certain time in my life where I'm trying to hold on to something just to collect a check. Again, people will forget all about you. The people may love you now, but realize this, when you get at a certain stage where you're not able to minister, they're going to easily forget about you. And it's important that you take care of your future, take care of yourself. When I reach a certain age, I want Lady Hankerson and myself to be able to go to the beach and to be able to uh, relax on the beach. We are able to do that every now and then now, but I'm talking about, you know, as long as I want to. And I worry about different uh, positions and office. Well, you're doing so much, Hankerson. I'm doing it while I can. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day because the night is coming when no man can work. Night is not just death, but there's the evening time when you just don't have the energy. You know, the scripture talks about in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, when desire is gone and all those type of things. So serve God while you're young and while you're in your youth. I'm middle-aged, but I still consider myself to be young. And so it's important in, in your young age ministers and preachers, take care of your business, take care of your business. So should a preacher work? I believe that a preacher, even if you start off and your ministry is flourishing and you're getting thousands of dollars and all of that kind of stuff, I still believe that you need to work just for the experience of it. If it's no more than just the experience of being able to relate to the people, you need to know what it is that your what your people are dealing with. If you if you say, well, I've just preached my whole life, you really cannot relate to the people. You cannot really relate to uh, real life. Hello, I got saints on from Brazil. Um, you're not really able to relate to the people. And the reason why is because you've never uh, been out there where they're at. Uh, you don't know what it is to deal with office politics and rush hour traffic and union wages and um, obedience and denials. You know, I, I um, worked at a job uh, as of uh, last year in August. That was the end of it. But uh, uh, 17 years, and some of you may be on here too from Joyce Meyer Ministries, one of the most wonderful times uh, in my life, one of the greatest experiences in my life. That season did come to an end because there's just so much that I uh, have to do, but it was a blessing to actually work. It, I, I learned obedience. Jesus learned obedience by the things that he uh, suffered. What are you saying? What about those that want mega money before they come? Let them stay where they at. That's what I got to say. <laughs> I'll answer that question right there, uh, uh, <laughs> Lady Cook. Yeah, those that want mega bucks before you you come, you well, you you stay. I don't deal with that. I don't I don't deal with that. And now some people do that because of um, a deposit is what it is, so that they can hold that date. Because there are people that will hold a date for you, and you could be ministering someplace else, uh, but you held that date for that person at the last minute. They cancel on you. And here, instead of you being able to accept five or six other engagements that you could have got on that night, now you don't have nothing because you denied those uh, engagements because you were waiting on somebody else. Uh, and, 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 and then they just canceled on you at the last minute. So, yes, some ministries may require a deposit to hold that date. But then when people start telling you, I need uh, four or $5,000 now, and then X number of thousands of dollars, when I get there, there's a problem. And that's why it's important in ministry that you have relationships. So uh, evangelists and preachers, again, that was a good question. Evangelists and preachers, don't just call up people cold turkey. You got the um, Church of God in Christ book. And uh, of course, I'm here tonight in my general council of pastors and elders, Ty, since I'm talking about pastoring and preaching and talking. Don't get in the book and just go down the book and start calling people that you don't know or don't have relationship with. Develop some kind of relationship with these churches and people. Show that you are concerned about their ministry and their vision. And then perhaps they will open up the door and allow you to come into their ministry. But just to call a cold turkey, that doesn't work now like it did 30 or 40 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, you could say, I'm Evangelist Hankerson. I'm from St. Louis and I'm here. The Lord laid your ministry on my heart. They'll give you a Sunday morning and say, hey, take it and raise an offering for you and everything. 
That was 30 years ago. That does not happen uh, now. Nowadays, people are going to do background checks on you and everything and call all around the nation because there's been so many abuses. So I, I can see, uh, Lady Cook, if there's a deposit that's necessary to hold a particular date, a reasonable deposit, so that if you renege on that date, at least the person has some type of supplementary income uh, in case they've lost it because they, they lost other engagements that they could have been accepting. But for someone to tell you, I need uh, five or $6,000 right now, um, I, I do have an issue with that. And you haven't even cracked the Bible yet. I need to hear something first. You need to share from the word of God. But that's why I'm saying it's important that preachers have that opportunity to learn what it is to work. You know, when I worked on that job, uh, the scripture said Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. I learned obedience, you know. I worked jobs and things like that before. But, um, you know, when you're used to running things, a lot of times those of us in ministry, we're, we're running things. And my family has tell me all the time, now you may run evangelism and life center and the jurisdiction and the clergy coalition and all these things, but don't you come in this house <laughs> like, like that. You know, you have to kind of chill out, mister. You know, don't, don't come with that same kind of mentality. But those of us that are ministers, when we're used to just running things and then somebody else is in control of our schedule, uh, well, can I get off early? Can I go here, go there? And they say, no. I remember the first time that happened. It was something that came up. I think the doctor had told me something about a walking pneumonia I had or something like that. And so I was kind of worn out. And I said, well, let me see. Can I just go on home and rest about this? And I asked the manager, she may be on here. Joy, are you on here? If so, uh, say something, because she was on my uh, 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 screen the other day. <laughs> I said, well, can I get off and go do yada, yada? Because here's what the doctor said. She said, no. <laughs> and in my mind, I said, I know you didn't just tell me no. He said, no. <laughs> so I had to go right back to my desk and sit down and continue doing the work that I was doing. And so when, when you have experiences like that, it teaches you humility. It teaches you how to serve. And then it teaches you what your people are going through. They're going through dealing with office politics and things like this. And here's another scripture, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Jesus could have came straight down to earth and went straight to the cross, died for us. And that would have been it. He could have said, it is finished. Our redemption was paid in full. But no, he lived a normal life for 30 years. And then he went forth in the power of the spirit, you know, after, into his 31st year. As, uh, when he was 30 years old, he started his ministry. They say probably to about 33 and a half or so was when he was crucified and, and ascended. But he actually lived a normal life first, just like all of us, and showed us how to live that life. It says in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, you have to have the same attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think equality with God was something to hold on to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So if Jesus can humble himself, I believe that many of us need to humble ourselves as well so that we can know how to relate to people. You know, a lot of times when you're in full-time ministry, you have control over your schedule so you can do the things you need to do during the day and maybe relax or whatever and then come into service. And here you want to hold service all night till 11, 12 o'clock at night and can't understand what's wrong with people. Come on, y'all. Clap your hands. Stand up. Why are you sitting there looking like that? Those folks are worn out because they've been at work all day. Um, they had lunch, but they haven't had a chance to go home and take a shower and, and, and get dinner and get a bite to eat. Or maybe they got something that, you know, was just, um, you know, a, a, a greasy burger or something like that. Now they're sitting here in church and you want to talk all night long, want to fuss at them, want to take their money. By the time they get home and get settled, it's 11, 12 o'clock at night, and now they got to be up at 4 o'clock the next morning. And so you, you really don't know how to relate to them if you've never had to work a job. And I asked the question earlier, is it right for preachers to uh, have their spouse on the church payroll, their kids on the church payroll, their loved ones on the church payroll? It's all right if they're working and if they have some kind of experience, but to have whole families that have never uh, worked a, a regular job, and all they know is just to live off of the uh, funds that come from the church, uh, to me, that's really unfair because you cannot relate to the people. Uh, you cannot really relate to the things that the people are going through. And so just like Jesus humbled himself, just like Jesus humbled himself so that he can know what we're dealing with, we ought to do the same thing. 
Now, again, there's more to pastoring than uh, just um, um, uh, more to ministry rather than just pastoring. There's the evangelistic ministry. There's the ministry of uh, being a missionary in uh, the international realm. There's also administration. I know that with Joyce Meyer Ministries, when I was with them for uh, 17 years, Joyce had about 1,500 employees uh, at that particular time across the country and around the world. That was full-time ministry. Everybody was not up preaching. Everybody was not running around singing the Hallelujah Chorus, but people were actually working in full-time ministry and impacting the world. So don't think full-time ministry is you just getting up behind a pulpit cracking the Bible, having a handkerchief and screaming and getting an offering. There's all kinds of ministries. And a lot of times, I'm gonna say this in a very discreet manner, but I think you all can read in between the lines and hear what I'm saying. There's a difference between urban and suburban. And uh, many times those of us that are urban and in the inner city, we have a different um, mentality. Um, and really just to be specific, to be blunt, you know, in the black community, in the black church versus the um, uh, urban churches or the Caucasian churches, white churches, whatever, a lot of times there's a different mentality. And yes, there's going to be a different mentality because there's different cultures. But realize this, um, you'll go into the urban, suburban area and perhaps have a white ministry that has, and, and again, this is not set in stone because you have black ministries that are set up like this as well. You may have a ministry that has 5,000 members and they have a pastoral staff of 10 people. Now there is a senior pastor who is the uh, lead pastor of that congregation, but those that are on the pastoral staff, if you ask them what their job is or what they do, they will tell you, I'm a pastor, I'm Pastor Elijah, I'm Pastor um, John, I'm Pastor Bob. Uh, they may be the children's pastor, they may be the uh, youth pastor, they may be the seniors pastor, they may be the pastor of worship and fine arts. Um, they, they may be the activities pastor, but they are actual pastors full time. The people realize that they are pastors. And many times in the black community, we kill our senior pastors because we believe that one person ought to be doing everything. That one person, you know, is supposed to be the one that calls fire from heaven, you know, opens up the Red Seas, you know, prays over our car and our car starts working, raises the dead all able to call him or her at two o'clock in the morning, they come running to the hospital. And then of course, when they die, oh, we're gonna give you a big funeral and give you a send off. But then before your body's even cold, before you get in the grave, we're asking who's gonna get to church, who got all his money, you know, that type of thing. And so I notice even in our communities, we've got to do better. I can say this as an African-American because I've been black my whole life, 46 years. Um, you'll see in the suburban areas, a church of 5,000 people, with 10 people on the pastoral staff, and they're all serving and uh, hopefully working together. But then you come into our communities, a lot of times you'll have 5,000 churches with 10 people apiece because we can't work together. You know, everybody wants to have their own little kingdom and their own little following. And I was sharing with one of my members on Sunday, it's almost culty. You know, you have that, your little group of 10 people, this pastor has their group of 10 people, that pastor has their group of five people, and, and the people before they leave and shout, they're watching you. You know, before they have some, allow somebody to pray for them, they're looking at you. And that's really almost cultic when you get like that. So realize this, there's more to full-time ministry than just pastoring. There's, again, there's being a, a chaplain. You can be a chaplain. That's full-time ministry. So never just limit yourself. Realize this also in the scriptures, the Bible commands a man to take care of his family. Some of you are going to say I'm being chauvinist with this. But I'm sticking with the word of God and I will not compromise. If you're a man and you have a family, mister, it's your job to take care of your family. I got to preach. I got to you make sure your family's taken care of first before you talk about running out and preaching. And again, you may get upset with this and say that he's being a chauvinist because I know that there are so many ladies that have to take care of households. I understand that you're the breadwinner. And we appreciate everything you're doing, but I'm talking to the men now. If you are a man and you say that you're a preacher, don't have that family suffering because you won't provide and you won't take care of them. Realize this. It says in 1 Timothy 5 and 8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, Pastor Sanders, Chairman Sanders, of Elders Council, um, here's something that I want to uh, share and this is very important. I read to you from the scriptures that it is biblical for a preacher to earn their living from the preaching of the gospel. 
Now that has to be within reason. The Bible tells you with all you're getting, get an understanding or get understanding. Now, if you go out and you have 20 children while you're past, hold, hold up just a minute now, you are going to have, you and your wife going to have to have a, you, <laughs> well, you know, you're going to have to have a talk or something like that. You know, we can't tell you what to do as far as how many children that you're going to have. But my late pastor, the Bishop T.L. Westbrook, uh, pastor of the New Jerusalem Church of God in Christ, the founder and prelate of the Washington State jurisdiction in his lifetime. When he started New Jerusalem in 1957, I think he might have had five or six kids. Bishop Westbrook had 13 children in his lifetime, 11 of those living. He, he and Mother Westbrook had 13 children. Bishop Westbrook did whatever was necessary in order to deal with, um, and I'm going to answer that question. That's a good question. Uh, in order to deal with taking care of his family. He worked two and three jobs until he finally was able to get the church where it needed to be. But Bishop Westbrook didn't just work jobs. He had investments that he had on the side. I'm not going to tell you how much he was worth when he passed away, but he was worth a whole lot of money, and it didn't all come from the church. He was just a wise investor. He was a wise investor. He was a wise businessman. Now, uh, those of you on Instagram, you can join me on uh, Facebook because that's about to go out. But uh, he was a wise investor and he was able to take care of all of his children. But again, if you're going to be pastoring a church and uh, you're having a new child every year and uh, it's been 10 or 12 years, and now you're at kid number 12 and, and like the song say, ain't no stopping us now. Uh, don't expect the saints just to have to, you know, they're rallying trying to take care of you. You know, you're going to have to supplement that income some kind of way in order to be fair with the saints. So should your church be ran as a family business? I don't believe the church ought to be ran as a family business. Uh, it should be ran in a business manner, in a business manner, meaning no wasteful spending. Uh, financial goals need to be set. You need to have integrity with taking care of the families. But for ministerial uh, families to have it where, all right, you know, I'm employing my cousin, I'm employing this. Now, if they're working, that's one thing. But there's some ministries where, and this is wrong, there are some ministries where uh, the pastor has the whole family on payroll of the church, and these people are not all attending the church. They're not all faithful to the church, and they're sure enough not working in the church. That's not fair to the saints. And then to take your local church and deed it to your family. It's wrong if you're a pastor to have your church deeded to you and your family. It should, it should, it's, it's the, it should be deeded uh, to the church. And if you're Church of God in Christ, that's how come they say deeded to say Church of God in Christ. According to our Constitution, when you read all of the amendments, Memphis is not trying to own your building. The church of God in Christ is not trying to own your building. The church has enough uh, headache to deal with as it is now. So the church of God in Christ is not in the business. And that's a lot of false information that's going out there. Don't become church of God in Christ because they're going to take your building. Now, that might have been way back in the day, but uh, that's not happening in the 21st uh, century. Some of these saints, <laughs> some of these church folks carry guns and things like that, and they'll, you know, show you. You're not walking up in here taking over this church. But uh, nevertheless, that's the, a false misnomer that's out there. The Memphis is going to come in and take your church. Bishop Blake has said many times, we're not coming in here to take over. We're going to find out from you who you would like to serve as your pastor and hear what your pleasure is and then go in there. We have such a gentleman as our presiding bishop doesn't come in raking and raping the church spiritually. Excuse me for that term, but that's what happens in many cases um, in, in other uh, parts of the body of Christ where the, the, the church is just spiritually taken advantage of. But our presiding bishop, Charles Edward Blake, does not do that. He'll come in and say, hey, here's what we need to do. We want to find out, you know, what you all would like to do as a church and get done with that as quickly as possible so that the church can roll on and that the ministry can be blessed. I have seen that over and over again with my own eyes. But the reason why Bishop Mason told the uh, pastors of the churches to deed their church, Church of God in Christ, he said, because it's wrong for you to deed it in your name and in your family's name. Why is that? Because, Sister Webb, if the church is deeded in the name Hankerson or Jones or Webb or whoever, when the pastor dies, the church building and properties become the inheritance of that family. And there have been cases where families have sold the church. From out of, here these people have been tithing. And, and, and they've been frying every piece of fish that they can get out the Mississippi River to pay, uh, pay off the church and every piece of chicken they could get their hands on, they fried it, uh, paying their tithes and all. And now the pastor dies, the building goes to the 
uh, 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 family and the family says, we ain't interested in this, sell the church out from under the people, collect the money, split the money up and the people are outdoors. That's wrong. So that's wrong. The church should be ran as a business, but not your personal business. So what I encourage uh, families to do, pastoral families to do is this. Don't put all your apples in one cart. Have something besides the ministry. Have something besides the church. You know, don't let church be your entire life. Jesus should be your entire life, but not church. You should have something outside of church, some kind of hobby, your investments, some kind of income, something to take the place because, again, you're not always going to be in demand. If family members are working and able, yes, compensation is appropriate, but not as the family's personal bank. Well, um, I'm the pastor of the church, and my cousin needs a $2,000 loan, so I don't even check with the church officers and the deacons and the board of directors. I just go and get $2,000 and loan it. Um, you know, to my cousin or give it to them or whatever. That is wrong. It is wrong. And this kind of stuff is happening around the country where people are using church money as their personal bank, taking out loans. You're not Bank of America. That church is not commerce. That church is not U.S. Bank. That's the house of God. That's the people of God. You can't do that, Mr. Mrs. You can't do that. That's wrong. Matter of fact, you know, it's really illegal as a nonprofit organization for you to be doing that. There needs to be checks and balances when it comes to that. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 tells us, Paul, Paul said, I know after I leave, savage wolves are going to come in and they're not going to spare the flock. So we have to make sure that, you know, we take care of the people of God, that we share with the people of God and not take advantage of him. The priesthood in the New Testament, as I shared with you before, is all believers, but God does have the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. I don't have time to go into it. I'm going to be done in probably about the next 10 minutes or so. But when the church first started, church government was very, very uh, primitive, you could say. You have an apostle that would go in. The apostle would work out a church. And the assistants to the apostle were later known as bishops. But you had groups of elders that would oversee local churches. Groups of elders oversaw local churches. It wasn't until later on that the church developed the concept of one person pastoring the local church. And eventually, when Christianity became the official religion of the empire, all of the trappings of the empire, imperialism, seeped into the church. And that's when all that pomp and circumstance came into the church. And the bishop was basically God. The pastor was the Holy Ghost Jr. and all of that. That's not how Jesus started the church off. All of that came in later on when the church was infiltrated, when the church infiltrated Rome and Rome infiltrated the church. All of that came in there. So realize this, um, leaders realize this, pastors, um, a lot of times we may see ourselves as kings and things like that, but we're not kings. We're not, we're, we're priests and kings as far as in God's eyesight, but not before the people. Uh, realize, yeah, but Hankerson, there were people in the Bible that were wealthy. Okay, Abraham was a rancher. David was a very prosperous king, so he was a politician. Uh, Joseph was a prime minister, second in command of the nation. So these weren't people that were just preaching all the time. These were people that had successful business ventures that God used to do business for him and to proclaim his word. And so they were business folks. And so everybody in the Bible was not just an outright preacher per se. There were politicians, there, there were civic leaders that were involved in upbuilding the work of God. And so we, we must not take all of that imperialism from Rome and the imperialism of how David was treated and, and things like that. And when we walk in, people have to put rose petals down and all of that because this is the man of God. We're nothing but dust. That's all we are that has been anointed by God. So let's let's keep the right view of ourselves. Listen, saints of God, as I um, wrap this up, congregations have to be realistic in your expectations of preachers and preachers, you have to have realistic expectations as well. Congregations, just because you give churches, just because you give your preacher a check, um, it doesn't mean that you have 24 asset, 24 hour, seven days a week access to that man or woman of God. The man or woman of God has to set boundaries. I remember one time Lady Hankerson and I were um, uh, celebrating our anniversary and someone had what we thought was an emergency. And when we found out what it was, we're like, you, you, you interrupted our anniversary for this and you knew it was our anniversary. You know, uh, we've had people interrupt Christmas and Thanksgiving. Also. So preachers, your expectations have to be realistic as well. 
you know, I, I wouldn't say that. Call me anytime. Call me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Listen, I've had to set boundaries for myself. Anyone that uh, knows me knows that the way to get a hold of me is to text. And I have people that get mad. I'm not texting. And my response is, well, you're not going to hear from me because I'm over four different organizations. And the only way that I can manage all these different lines of communication with all these different, what if I want to give you some money? The people that want to give me money, they know how to text me. And they have done it. And they're glad to do it. So I have to set up boundaries. And that's the way that I keep my sanity. You know, because if I lose my mind, I'm going around here, you know, nutty as a fruitcake and everything like that. All folks are going to do is talk about, me. well, he's crazy anyways. He shouldn't have put all that pressure on himself. Folks are going to talk about you. So you have to set boundaries. So my boundaries are set. If you want to get a hold of Hankerson, then you must text. If you get mad and say that you're not going to text, well, then you're not going to get a hold of me. And if you want to, I don't know how to text. Well, you're going to have to find out how to do it. And that's how I'm able to communicate with five or six or seven or eight different people all at one time. So preachers, what are some of the boundaries? Put that down in the comment section. What are some of the boundaries that you have set for yourself? I've set up another boundary. When I'm enjoying family time, there is no interruption. It, somebody died. Well, well, I tell you what, if, there's, if they're dead, there's nothing that I can do right now. But you need to come and raise them. There, there's plenty of other people that we have on staff that will be glad to come and pray for them. But if I'm dealing with my family, if I'm having my precious family time, there are no interruptions. And I've had to make that boundary set because, again, there's been so much that has happened in the past where you think it's an emergency. Realize this. Everybody else's emergency is not your emergency. So it may be urgent to, to, to them. Uh, uh, it may be something where I, I need to figure out how to do this paper. Well, I tell you what, you figuring out how to do a paper is not an emergency for me. So realize you set the boundaries of what's important to you, what your emergencies are, how to communicate with you. All right. You're the one that sets that boundary. So don't let people say, well, because we pay him a check, you know, this is how it's supposed to be. Not so. No preacher should be in it only for a check. Luke chapter 4, verse 28 through 30 says to count up the cost. You're not always going to get good checks with this. So it's important. <laughs> yeah, you're not always going to get good checks. Sometimes you get checks and they'll bounce. So I've had that to happen. And that's why somebody asked a question about contracts. I don't necessarily say contracts, but agreements should be uh, taken care of. I had a situation that just happened recently where I preached somewhere and they rushed me off and said, hey, we'll get you something later on. I'm like, hold on just a minute. You don't do people like that. Now, thank God, just with all due respect, they did correct it um, later on. But um, if you don't trust a person, whatever, you may have to have an agreement. I wouldn't say a contract, but some kind of agreement, because I'm telling you, people will uh, put you up someplace that is uh, rat infested and roach infested. Um, they will call you in to preach. You'll, you'll raise an offering. Um, may raise, you know, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. They'll hand you $50 and give you a cold piece of chicken and uh, tell you, all right, you be blessed going back. Well, how am I going to get back? So some people do have to do agreements. There's a lot of abuses that take place out on the field. You'd be surprised the number of um, dishonest pastors that are out there that will use a revival as a fundraiser. And they will call you in, call call you in because they know that the people are going to come because of you and uh, raise an offering in your name and um, don't give you that offering. They'll keep it for themselves. Maybe there's a bill they had to pay or whatever. They'll take that money and use it for that. There's a lot of shysters. I'm just going to call it what it is that call themselves men and women of God that really need to go somewhere and sit down and get some integrity. That's why you got to watch all these people that say that they're independent. Who are you independent of? Why do you want to be independent? I'm kingdom, I'm kingdom. Well, you say that because you don't want to be accountable to anybody. Kingdom does not mean a free-for-all. Kingdom means you are accountable to somebody. You're accountable to the king. So again, no preacher should be in it for just for a check, but you do deserve a check. Uh, you can be full-time in ministry, um, and, and the scripture lets you know. <laughs> the, Bi the Bible tells you here this. It says um, in Ecclesiastes verse, chapter 5, verse 10, who let, whoever loves money never has enough. So make sure when you get into ministry that you're not in love with money because you're not always going to get a whole lot of money with this. So I trust and hope and pray that you've received something uh, from this short uh, talk that we've been able to share with you. Are you getting something out of these lives that we're sharing every week? I appreciate those of you that tune in week after week. It means so much, the words of encouragement, the inbox messages. Um, yeah, sometimes it's controversial. When I first started doing this, there were some people that asked, they said, has Hankerson lost his mind? What does he mean about these topics? And so as they listened, they said, oh, okay, he's given us a balanced view. 
based on the word of God. But they really thought I had lost it and was going off in the, on the deep end. Uh, but that's not the case. I've had people that have wanted to attack me about it because they say you're getting too much influence with the people and too many people know who you are and all of that. I'm not, a, I'm not on this trying to be famous or anything like that or for people to know my name. If uh, anybody knows me, I'm kind of just a regular uh, everyday person. You may even call me a boring person because I, you know, I don't just like a lot of limelight and fanfare. Now, what I do like is respect. One thing I cannot stand is disrespect. That's the main thing I can't, I despise disrespect. You know, as long as I have my respect, that's all that matters. Whether you call my name or not, whether my name is out in lights or not, whether I'm famous or not, that doesn't bother me. As long as I have my respect, I'm okay. And what I try to make sure that I do is live the type of life um, that demands respect. You know, you can't just demand respect verbally. You have to live the kind of life that literally demand that people respect you. And that's what I seek to do. So here's what I ask that you would do. Um, this teaching, I believe, tonight is invaluable to people that are involved in ministry. Uh, this is invaluable to people that are looking to go into full-time ministry and maybe those that are already involved in full-time ministry, but um, nevertheless, you're not you know, understanding all the do's and don'ts of being in full-time ministry. I need you to share this with them. Now, this lesson is going to end up being on my uh, YouTube channel. It's going to be on my YouTube channel, and that's under Bishop. Elijah Hankerson. So please, as you're viewing this, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, Bishop Elijah Hankerson, because everybody's not on Facebook. Everybody's not on social media, but everybody can ascertain or access uh, YouTube on the internet. They can simply put in the name and then those videos come up. And these videos are wholesome. I believe, as you see, they are biblically based. Um, they are balanced. I do my research. I try to make sure that I don't come before you just with junk. And now I'm not screaming on this. Anybody that's uh, been with me in a worship service, because I hear people, sorry to hit the computer, but I hear a lot of people uh, say, well, you know, I thought he just screamed and hollered and turned around. No, actually teaching is my first love. But what ends up happening when I'm preaching the, 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 the glory, hallelujah, the glory and the power of God hits and I just get so excited about the word that the hoop man comes out. But uh, I do my research and I, I share with you all a few books earlier um, that will be a blessing. It's on the uh, comment section here and you can look at it. Evangelist Angela Clinton, thank you so much. You're such a blessing to the body of Christ and um, to the Church of God in Christ and in, in, in specifically and to the body of Christ in general. We thank God for you. She has placed the information on there. Thank you, Dish Missionary Harris. She's down here as Jacqueline Toller. She's put down the information for registration for the convocation for Missouri Midwest. Sister Denise Roach, I don't even have to ask her what to do. She just knows what to do and she just gets the job done. And that's what I appreciate. You know, if I have to tell you 50 million times to have 20 meetings with you just to figure out how you can make a post on Facebook, something is wrong. And so I thank God for her being able to put that out there. So thank God for these wonderful women of God that are doing such a fabulous job. But I need you to share this teaching with every preacher, every minister that you come into contact with. And I believe that it will be a blessing to them. Um, there's a lot of young preachers. There's a lot of young male preachers that are not taking care of their family. And it's not right for you. You here, Here's the thing. Uh, the size of the ministry determines the workload. Uh, now, I don't pastor a, a, a mega church. We have a few hundred people at Life Center and a National Church of God in Christ. I only have 10 or 20,000 people yet. But to have the church, to have the Department of Evangelism, to have my community work, um, with the coalition to have my work with the jurisdiction, that's a major workload. And so, of course, it's going to entail uh, a whole lot of, I'm talking about 12, 13, 14, 15 hour days uh, on a regular basis. But now, honestly speaking, Brother Pastor, you got five members in your church and you're talking about full-time ministry. What, what are you doing throughout the day that um, there's just so much that is, is, is going on? And I can see if you only have five members and you're really out there trying to do the work of ministry. You're visiting the hospitals, you're visiting the jails, you have a phone line ministry, you're there at the church having prayer every day. I can definitely see something like that. But if you only have a handful of members, your wife is out there working, the kids are out there working, you know, you're just sleeping all day and then you want to come and hold church all night and want them to bring a check to you and everything. Uh, something is wrong with that. Take care of your family, take care of your household. Your kids shouldn't be looking nappy-headed like buckwheat from those 
um, shows that they used to show back in the 70s when I was coming up, those black and white shows, you'd have buckwheat and his hair was all nappy, so nappy and Moses couldn't part it. Um, you, you, you don't want to have, you know, your kids and your family uh, looking like that. Take care of your family. Don't have those kinds of abuses. Make sure they're taken care of. And um, one of these days I'm going to deal with that subject as well because there's so many young ministers now that are not getting married. And this one thing, Paul had a call to celibacy. But listen, you know, we're not crazy. Everybody's not celibate. Everybody's not celibate. You, you're young and in your youth, well-bodied and able to work and do what you need to do. And you travel around the nation going all around the country. And you're telling me that you live in a celibate, saved and sanctified life. Well, okay. All right. Like we really believe that uh, God is able. Now, I, I uh, was a young pastor for five years. I was single. And uh, I, you can never, you can never say that there's ever been a scandal on my life. I don't know what it is to fornicate. I don't know what it is to, to commit adultery. I was sexually pure until the day I got married. My wife was sexually pure until the day she got married to me. God kept us. And I know that God is able to keep you, but I got married in my early 20s. You know, uh, the Bible says, hallelujah, it's better to marry than to burn. And if you feel the fire burning, then what you need to do is you need to go and you need to get married. The Bible says better to marry than to burn. But to be out there making shipwreck of your ministry, you know, you up preaching and people are getting blessed by the word that's coming forth from your mouth. And then after service, you out with some lady in the hotel room and all of that, two or three ladies and all that kind of stuff. And even nowadays, you have so many uh, that, that are doing this same sex nasty sin and dirty sin, you know, don't destroy your life and your ministry like that because people will not forget the Holy Ghost. God himself may forgive you, but the people will never forget. And they'll say, oh, wasn't that that same preacher way back when? And here's the thing about saints. Saints won't say nothing. They'll sit back and they won't say nothing. But 30, 40 years down the road, I've seen men of God that have got their act together and years down the road, the time and the opportunity comes up for them to become uh, the possible bishop of a jurisdiction or whatever, and folk will pull it. Well, you remember 40 years ago when he was 20 years old. You remember 40 years ago when he was 21 years old and out there on the field, people will be quiet. They will love you. They will shout over your preaching. But then when the opportune time comes, they're going to bring up everything in regard to that. So live a clean life. Live a holy life. Be a person of integrity. Be a person that people can look up to and say, that's a man or woman of God that knows how to take care of their family, that knows how to take care of their loved ones. That's so important because in this time, people are not just listening to what you're saying. They're watching how you live. They're watching how you treat your family. They're watching exactly how you deal with your loved ones. That is so important. And the Bible even says, if a man can't have charge of his own household, then how's he gonna take care of the house of God? If, you're, if, you're, if your house is out of order, the kids assassin you, wife doesn't respect you, you tell the dog to, to come here and sit down, the dog looks at you and <laughs> keeps on going, <laughs> not paying you no attention, something is wrong and people don't respect you. And if they don't respect you in, their, in your home, they're not gonna respect you in the church. So live a respectable life. That's what these teachings are all about. These teachings are in order to correct much of the error that's been out there because the job of the evangelist is not just to proclaim the good news, but to just stand in defense of the faith. The Bible says in Jude, I was gonna write to you about the common salvation, but here's what I decided I was gonna do to tell you, you must earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. So saints of God, friends, family, loved ones, enemies, sinners, haters, if there be any, I want you to know I will not stop, but I'll continue to proclaim this word from the Lord, to continue to proclaim the word of God so that God's people can be blessed, so that the ministry can be blessed, so that the church, so that the kingdom of God can flourish. That's what it's all about, to feed you with manna from on high. Hallelujah. Psalm 119 and 11, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalm 119 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Psalm 119 and 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The evangelist does not just have a job outside of the church, but the evangelist has a job inside the church. 
the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher has been given for the edifying of the body of Christ, that the body might grow, that the body might be effective, that it might grow into full stature. So that's the purpose of these teachings. I know people try to politicize and everything. Well, Hankerson's running for office, and that's why he's doing this and that and the other. Listen, I'm doing now what I've been doing for 30 years. This is nothing new. Don't try to politicize it. Politics has this particular place. Politics has this particular time. But I'm sharing the word of God so that the body of Christ can be built up so that ministers can be effective. I want to pray for your ministry right now. Those preachers, pastors, and evangelists that are listening, I'm not just talking off the top of my head. God is the one that did this. God is the one that made me the pastor of Life Center Church. God is the one that blessed me and a team of men and women to create a jurisdiction from scratch, not split a jurisdiction, not steal churches from another jurisdiction. For those of you who have heard about you that have to say that, well, Missouri Midwest is stealing churches from other jurisdictions. We're not interested in stealing no churches from no other jurisdiction. If you steal something, it's not yours. So we're not interested in that. We're interested in expansion of the kingdom of God. We're interested in men and women getting into their rightful place. God is the one, y'all yeah, call things out, I'm not afraid. Uh, God is the one that anointed us to start this jurisdiction from scratch. God is the one that touched the heart of my presiding bishop and the general board and the general assembly to affirm it, to place me over the department of evangelism. God is the one that touched the hearts of Methodists and Baptists and Lutheran and Presbyterian, non-denominational and Salvation Army and Catholic to say, we want to elect this man to be our president over the clergy coalition. So if God has done that, then I'm, uh, I have faith enough to believe that God has given me a message for preachers, for ministers, so that you can be effective, so that you can be what God has called you to be. The devil wants to tear you down. The devil wants to destroy your ministry. The devil wants you to be shipwrecked. But I want you to know that your ministry is going to flourish. You will bear fruit. Enough of this jealousy and division and strife between ministers. When we all team up and realize that there's only one enemy that we have, there's only one God to be exalted. There's only one savior that's able to save. And we team up and come together. The scripture says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We will take this nation and other nations for our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. We've got Brazil on here. We can take Brazil. We have other nations, Mexico, uh, uh, Canada is on the line. We can take these nations for Jesus Christ together. There's enough work for everybody. I don't have to be jealous of you. You don't have to be jealous of me. I don't have to compete with you. There is enough ministry out there for all of us to do until we close our eyes and go into eternity. So allow me to pray with you. Father, I pray for preachers right now, pastors, evangelists, ministers, missionaries out on the field, those that have gifts of administration, those that have the ministry of helps. I pray for all of them right now, God, that you would touch. I thank you to God for binding the devil of discouragement that demon of discouragement that comes to tell them that they'll never have a fruitful ministry. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. I bind it right now. When I speak forth over your life, that God's will shall be done in your life. You will go where God wants you to go. You will have what God wants you to have. You will say what God wants you to say. And God will anoint the place, every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon. God has given it unto you. I speak forth that you break forth now on the north, the south, the east, and the west, and God begins to bring you everything that you need because as you delight yourself in him, he gives you the desires of your heart. As you ask, it's given. As you seek, you find. As you knock, the door comes open, and no good thing does God withhold from you because you walk upright. Every preacher under the sound of my voice that is viewing this video right now that's been under financial attack, financial catastrophes happening in your life. If it's not one thing, it's something else. I bind the works of the enemy right now and I plead the blood over your family. I come against stress. I come against high blood pressure. I come against pressure on your body, on your mind, on your spirit. I pray right now for your mental health. I speak right now that you are sound of mind. You're not crazy. You're not insane. God will keep you in perfect peace because your mind is set upon him. You have the mind of Christ. 
God is watching over you to protect you right now, body, mind, and spirit, and is all sanctified holy unto him. Father, I thank you right now for touching the men and the women of God. I bind the spirit and demon of depression right now. It goes right now in Jesus' name. Every demon of depression that has been holding you back and binding you up, you've been getting up and encouraging everybody else. You've been praying for everybody else. You've been lifting up everybody else, but when you go home, you're battling against depression. You foul demon of depression. I call you out right now. In Jesus' name, go your way. The blood is against you. Satan, we adjure you by Jesus Christ. Take your hands off of that man of God. Take your hands off of that woman of God. I declare right now that God touches your heart. That's right, your physical heart. God touches the organs and limbs of your body. I rebuke strokes right now and heart attacks in the name of Jesus. Migraine headaches, they have to go right now. The peace of God begins to settle upon you in the name of Jesus. I speak forth over you that you are anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you let your requests be made known unto God and God keeps your heart and God keeps your mind. I decree and declare that your children are healthy. I decree and declare that your spouse is healthy and holy. I declare it right now. Peace in your household. I bind the demon of confusion. I speak peace right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for victory. I come against confusion in that local church right now. Attacks against the finances of that local church in order to stop it from going forth in your will for that church. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. And I thank you, dear God, that you give us the power to get well. I speak blessings over our investments as ministers of the gospel. I speak forth benefits right now. I speak forth retirement. Oh, I speak forth vacations because you told me in Mark chapter 11, you said, when I pray, believe that I have the things that I have said and that I've spoken and I will receive them. I will have whatever I say. And God, this is the confidence that I have that when I ask according to your will, First John 5, I know that you hear me and I know that I have the petitions that I've asked of you because I ask according to your will. So I declare your will. I declare your favor. I declare your power upon every minister of the gospel right now. I come against burnout, burnout goes right now. Burnout goes right now in Jesus' name. Those of you that have been burned out, you, you've just lost your joy. You've lost your oomph. You've lost your drive. You seem like it's just gone. I declare fire right now, the fire and power of the Holy Ghost. I speak forth over your life right now that his word is in your heart like a burning fire. Shut up in your bones. God, stir up that gift right now. Stir up that fire right now. Stir up those operational gifts, those ministry gifts. Stir up that anointing right now in the name of Jesus. There will be no burnout. You're not going to burn out. Hallelujah. But you are going to be used to the glory, to the power, to the honor, and to the splendor of God. God's glory shall be revealed in your life. If you receive it, clap your hands and praise God and give him some glory right now and say it is done in Jesus' name because every time I turn around, God is blessing me. Got to close right now. Been with you an hour and a half. Got to go into Bible study here at Life Center, but I feel the fire burning. I wish I had Dr. Cole to come and sing it. I can't sing it like her, but I feel the fire burning. Somebody praise God right now. Come on, put your hands together and give him some glory. Clap your hands. Magnify him. Give him praise right ever, wherever you are right now. Hallelujah. Burnout goes right now. Burnout goes. It goes. It goes in Jesus' name. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The peace of God overtakes you right now. Man, God touches you right now. Give him glory and praise wherever you are because God is lifting your spirit. Hallelujah. The spirit of heaviness is gone right now. And the joy of the Lord begins to overtake you in Jesus' name. Open your mouth. Clap your hands. Give him glory. Turn around and tell him every time I turn around. Hallelujah. God is blessing me. I speak for clapping in your hand. Dance in your feet, joy in your heart, peace in your mind. Hallelujah. You'll never be the same again. Enemy just wanted to hold you back and destroy you and take you down, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard. I didn't hear it through the grapevine. I heard it through the word of God. Hallelujah. That Jesus came, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. He is able to do it for you right now. Give him praise, and we thank you so much. Share this video with somebody in ministry and tell them to be encouraged in Jesus' name. Until next time, may the Lord bless you real good, because every time, every time, I don't want to turn around and fall down in this chair, but every time I turn around, God is blessing me. Be bountifully blessed today.